Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the REBI webinar today, Opportunity to Connect with Social Media. Uh, so now to get started, I'd like to introduce um, Melanie McLean. Melanie is from Pennsylvania. Uh, she is a longtime instructor of REBI, teaches our credentialing courses, and she is uh, teaches uh, many classes, uh, most definitely, as well as does uh, different presentations to state associations and local boards in addition to teaching credentialing courses. Um, we're thrilled to have Melanie uh, join us today for our uh, Navigating the New Normal 2.0. And Melanie, I'll turn it over to you at this point. Great, thank you. And thanks everyone for coming. It's great to be here. And these are interesting times. So I'm going to just get started here. By now, you're probably pretty frustrated. Uh, Jenny and I were chatting before this started, and I think everyone's getting a little bit frustrated. It's um, certainly not what we're used to, and we know that this is normally such a busy time of year from, uh, for us. I know NAR had the statistic that I saw that 40% of sales are made in the months of March and April. So speaking for myself as a broker, I'm in Pennsylvania, on Friday, my part of the state will be allowed limited real estate activity because we're in the yellow zone. Uh, the rest of the state is red, it's still shut down. But as a broker, our pipeline is almost empty. And if you're a broker or a manager, that's scary because we've been shut down since early March. And so we did close what we had in the pipeline. Fortunately, we have some great title companies and attorneys who move those sales forward, but it is a scary thing to be sitting at the beginning of May in a real estate brokerage without a pipeline. I think you can all agree with that. However, I am a believer in when life gives you lemons, you make lemonade. I think we're all trying to use our time wisely. I don't know if you had an elementary school teacher who made this comment, but I can remember my grammar school teachers would sometimes make a comment, either you used your time wisely or noted don't, doesn't use her time wisely, which was kind of the kiss of death for your mom and dad. But basically, we've been shut down. We're gonna be continue to be shut down in many places. It certainly is not gonna be business as normal. We can do a lot of things in that time. Some people are cleaning out closets, I'm in that category. Some people are binge watching, I'm not so much. Some people are reading, I'm a reader so I'm doing that, but my goal for myself is to use my time as wisely as I can because this will not last forever and when we come out of it, I wanna be ready to go and I think you do too. So the first thing is contact re relationship management and we all know about this, this is nothing new. And every time I teach a class, that touches on this, and most classes do, unless I'm teaching use PAP to appraisers, in which case it does not. We all know the statistics from NAR are so sad because NAR, in that home buyer, home seller survey, asks people, Were you happy with the agent who handled your transaction? Would you use that agent again? And we get astonishingly high numbers 60 to 70 percent. Agent was great, would definitely use that agent again. And then you look at the other end, and it's roughly around 15 to 16% of people who actually come back and use the agent again. Now, we know there's a percentage people will lose regardless. Their best friend gets in the business, they decide to get in the business, whatever. But the truth of the matter is, most of that business we lose we lose because they forgot who you were. You didn't stay in touch, and this is not a two-way street. Staying in touch with past clients and customers, all of the burden is on us, none of them is on, their, on them. So everyone should have one. I know a lot of franchises have their own. There certainly are a lot of companies out there that market contact relationship management systems. And my only rule with anything is, if you will use it and it works for you, that's the one, but don't invest a lot of money in something fancy that you don't use, because that's kind of like getting a really expensive car, but you don't have a driver's license. 
So many agents do have contact relationship management systems and they understand the beauty of this is it's going to make them work smarter, not harder. So a few minutes ago, I talked about the pipeline. Everyone has a pipeline. The brokerage has one, the agents have one. We fill our pipeline with business. It is so much easier to put business in the pipeline when people come to us already sold on us as an agent and our company. It's not a cold, cold situation, meaning both cold to the company and cold to the agent. So number one, this is a time for you yourself and for your agents to check, are you working this contact relationship management system, your CRM? You have programs that tell you what to do and when. Some of them, like the Buffini one, says pop in and see people. Well, right now you can't pop in and see people. So at least not in person, so you're gonna to have to find a way to connect with them anyway. Now, the next thing is, how is that CRM? Is it out of date? True, honest confession, I will go through mine periodically and I will realize I have dead people in there and they're not coming back from the dead to buy a house, so I need to get them out of there. Does it have missing contact information? Or when you send an email, does it come back undeliverable because they've changed their email address? Does, does it include people you're no longer in touch with for whatever reason? Now, hopefully this is a real small percentage, but I'm willing to bet if we're honest, everyone on this call will agree. There are some people that once you conclude a transaction with them, you don't want them in your CRM. You have had a sufficient dose of them to last you a lifetime. But are the email addresses current? Are the phone numbers current? Now is the time to update it. So let's just say your friends on Facebook with client X who bought a house from you two years ago, you realize you don't have a current email address or maybe your the phone number isn't current. Reach out to them across social media. Hey, I'm just, you know, tuning up my contact relationship system, and I'm just wondering, I don't have the right stuff for you in case I'd like to send you something. Weed it out. Add people. Are there people you've done business with that you haven't added to this yet? And again, reach out to verify that information and connect through social media. Now, I put this slide in especially for you guys because so many of us are brokers and managers. Some of our agents are going to leave the business. I personally have one right now that's on the bubble, as I would say. She's really thinking about leaving. Um, she had some stuff that closed. She's got nothing in the pipeline. She's got children she's now homeschooling because our schools are closed. She doesn't have a lot of support in terms of babysitting. Now that the market is opening not back up, she's not sure how she's gonna get out to show property. So if people do leave, as much as possible, we want to make that as amicable as we can. And most of the times, there's no reason it can't be amicable unless, of course, we have a salesperson that we need to sever their relationship with the company because they've done something really bad, something illegal, something unethical, something that we just can't tolerate, in which case we know we have to sever that relationship and sever it completely and sever it at once. But lots of times, People are gonna ease their way out. So leave some doors open. You want to get access to that CRM of theirs if you do not already have access to it. Now, some of you are set up so that your agents are using company email and you have the ability to track all of that stuff. Some of you are not. Another thought is, a referral company if that is an option for you. So there are brokers I know in various states that have referral companies. Those agents don't belong to local MLS or anything like that because they do not actively list and sell. They do have a current license. They do get their continuing ed. I get these folks in CE classes all the time. Um, all they do is referrals. So they refer people, and the, usually it's the same broker who has both companies. They have the referral company and they have the actual active company. If you don't have one of these, maybe something to explore. If you've got someone who, let's just say they're 
at a stage in their life where this, the COVID-19 was the final nail in the coffin. And it was like, okay, I'm just done with this nonsense. I don't need to work anymore. I'm gonna retire. I'm gonna go live in the country where I don't have to worry about being around people. Amicable parting with you and that agent and talk to the agent about, you know, you have all these great contacts. How about a referral company? You don't have to get out and meet with buyers and sellers. You don't have to be exposed. But, you know, when one, one of your great past clients or customers contacts you and says, I'm ready to sell, instead of saying, oh, I'm sorry, I'm retired, I'm not in the business anymore, you say, you know what, I've taken a step backward and I'm not doing the active end. However, I've got this great agent at my company I can refer you to. So that would be a win-win for you and for the agent. Now, social media and the CRMs. Some people are not on social media. We all know that. There's some that are not, but a lot of people are. So we need to know what platforms they're on. Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, I'm not gonna list them all, you know them all. Um, you need to go where your clients are. Now, there's a great young realtor about two hours north of me who is doing a fabulous job with Instagram. He is in his early 30s, his entire client base is big on Instagram. So it's working really well for him. This is another thing that one size does not fit all. Facebook could be working beautifully for agent A and agent B is like, I don't know all those people on Facebook. My friends don't go there. They do Snapchat or something else. Now, the problem with social media, well, there's lots of problems, but I'm only gonna talk about these right now. Following is not enough and liking is not enough. You have to do engagement. That will completely change your feed on places like social, uh, like Facebook, and it will, will change how you're interacting with people. So this requires a little effort on your part. It might require you, depending upon your memory, to take notes or make notes or make a mental note of something. So here's what I mean by that. I have particular friends on Facebook that will respond to certain posts of mine. Now, Ginny and Maria are friends of mine on Facebook, so they're going to know where I kind of where I'm going with this. I have a dog, Maggie the Wonder Dog. Maggie and I go for walks just about every day, and I often post a picture of Maggie. Well, Maggie's got a fan club. Let me tell you, I will post a picture. Maggie the Wonder Dog says hi, and I have these friends that are right on it. One of my friends, who's also a dog lover and a dog owner, is a really lovely woman named Debbie Fairfax, and she's with the Indiana RECP, which is the uh, Real Estate Association School in Indiana. I just always make a point of tagging Debbie when I post something about animals, but dogs in particular. If you've got a friend, I've got a high school friend that I follow. He played trumpet. He still plays trumpet. Whenever I post about a musician who played any brass instrument, I tag him in it. And it sounds like work, but after a while it gets pretty easy. And you begin to learn more about your virtual friends, some of whom are friends you know in real life, some of whom are people you haven't seen in real life for a long time. You've reconnected with them on Facebook. Um, some of them are past clients and customers, so great way to figure out what's going on and what's interesting to them. Um, one of my Facebook friends, who's actually my daughter's age, bought a house that was our listing right in my neighborhood. And yesterday, Nicole posted that had things been normal, her oldest son would have graduated from elementary school and her youngest son would have graduated from kindergarten but neither of those events will happen. And she said it's a little bit sad for them. So if anybody feels like, you know, reaching out and sending them a card, I would really appreciate it. Well, I went to the store today and I got both Booker and Hunter graduation cards because that's the kind of thing we do to connect with people to go to where they are, to go what matters to them. I see a lot of people in social media and our business making it all about them and not all about everyone else, and you really want to bring that element in. Now, engagement means reading their posts, seeing what interests them. So when you think about your social media friends, 
I've got gardening friends. I've got reading friends. I've got music friends. I've got realtor friends. I've got all kinds of different friends and I know what their interests are because I'm following what they're doing. So again, engage them in posts about what their hotspots are. This shows that you are interested and paying attention. Now, speaking of posts that I mentioned, I post about my dog on my personal page and my grandkids and I always do historical things, who was born today, what was invented today, whatever. Um, the reason for that, even on my business page, I don't necessarily put that stuff on my business page, but I put a lot of articles about real estate on my business page and humor. Um, most of the research from NAR says what consumers do not want to hear from us in social media is a steady diet of you ought to sell your house with me, you ought to buy a house from me. Instead, you're, you're going to want to give them information that's useful to them. So many ways to do that. And so, you know, try to have a good balance with your social media of doing that. And again, reaching out to them about what interests them, tagging them for their interests, whether it's recipes, family, hobbies, humor. Um, I, I've got somewhat of a reputation for humor, which I love. Um, I've had people comment, I know I can be counted on for one smile a day from your posts. Folks, I am totally committed to trying to make everyone smile at least once a day, especially at this time in our country when there's not a whole lot of smiles out there, but smiling is really, really important and humor is important. Now, um, also, people are really getting into posting about their houses. Well, of course they are, because they feel like they've been under house arrest for two months. From what I gather from talking to um, my son, who's a contractor, the hardware store owner, and the building supply store owner that my son talks to, unprecedented levels of painting, which I interpret as people have been stuck at home, they're looking around and going, I hate this color. Why did we ever pick this color? Or, gee, this is dirty and shabby, let's fix it. I'm kind of hopeful some of these people, while they're at it, are gonna fix a lot of stuff and then they're going to call us and say, you know what, we still wanna move. But by the way, we freshly painted the downstairs, which would be huge. Same thing with the organizing. That's going to be good news for us if they put these homes on the market because we all know it's much easier to sell a freshly painted, organized home than otherwise. Now, they're homeschooling. There's a lot of humor to be seen there. If you ever follow me, you'll see some of that humor. And working from home. And I saw a post the other day from a young woman I know. I've known her husband all his life, and they live in Pittsburgh. In fact, I referred them to a realtor out there when they moved there. And she was just saying how difficult it is, and I'm quite certain it is, to be homeschooling two small children and trying to work remotely. And yeah, that's a big challenge. Uh, that's two different things all at one time. My own daughter has just begun working again for a real estate appraisal office remotely with a three-year-old who never stops asking questions. So I'm sure Lauren is having an interesting week. Now, your social media brand. This has to be authentic and it has to be you and you are the best version of you. Um, I really see people falling into a trap when they decide they have to emulate someone who's not what they are all about. It's just a mistake. Don't be an imitation of somebody else. Be the real you. Reflect. I try to make my stuff reflect that I have a career I do love. And I have the same interests and same frustrations as other people do. And again, I can't emphasize enough humor, smiles, be, be at the happy place and staying away from negativity. Now, this is also a great time. If you still sell, to do this. If you don't sell, get your agents to do it, maybe even show them how. But let's talk about warm calls. We talk about this in the SRS class, which is one of our awesome classes that we have at REBI. And a warm call is a call we have to somebody we did business with in the past. They know us, they like us, it is not a sales call, it is a check-in call, 
It's how are you doing? And if you remember from SRS, I think many of you have taken it, you follow Ford. And Ford stands for family, occupation, recreation, and dreams. Each one of those topics has the potential to spur a conversation into real estate. So for example, I call someone up and say, hey, how are you doing? How's the family? And the person says, well, you know what? We are finally empty nesters. Uh, Susie got married last February. Oh, well, that's great. Now, they're finally empty nesters. I'm calling with a little bit of luck. It's going to click. And that person's gonna say, you know, we were thinking about calling you because after all, it's a big house. It's a big two story, four bedroom and the kids are gone. And we're really thinking about downsizing. So we know that all of these topics will open that conversation. Occupation, are you still working at wherever? Yeah, we just hired a new guy. Maybe that will click with them. Oh, that new guy could call you. You could find them a house. Recreation, are they still doing what they like to do for recreation, whether it's fishing, kayaking, hiking, skiing, whatever it is they do. And then dreams, I always like to try to find out what people's dreams are because I think everyone's dreams are pretty cool. And that, <clears throat> excuse me, is another way to go in where, you know, maybe during the process they confided to you, you know, I'm working at ABC Real Estate or ABC Company making widgets but all of my life, I've really wanted to own a quilt shop. Well, that would give you the chance to, and by the way, I was thinking of you today because we just listed a perfect place for a quilt shop. Is that still your dream? So it gives you an opportunity to go there. Now for these times, I would modify it a little bit. I would just say, hey, how are you doing? It's a challenging time for all of us. It's very challenging. How are you coping? Is there anything I can do? Now, depending upon your circumstance and what you're willing to do, you have to make care, take care of your own safety. But for example, if you have elderly past clients and they're getting to the point where they're really nervous about going out to the pharmacy or going out to the store, I'd volunteer to go for them. You don't have to have personal contact. It can be a, hey, I'll pick that prescription up at the pharmacy, I'll put it in a plastic bag with a handle, I'll hang it on your back door, and I'll call you when it's there. So just a favor for doing, just to do a favor for someone, and people genuinely really appreciate favors. And I think a lot of people are very isolated and just enjoy conversation. Some of us are better at being alone than others, and some people are not so good at that. So think about that. Now, you might get in this kind of conversation, you know, before this started, I was thinking about calling you because we all know there were people who were right on the edge of listing their home when this hit. And I had a conversation the other day with someone who's going to list as soon as it's a little bit more back to normal. She's got some other things to do at her house. Lost her husband within the past year, but had had plenty of time to think about, did she want to stay in this house, which she doesn't want to stay in the house she's in. It needs a lot of exterior maintenance. It's not a good fit for her. And uh, she just said, I, I understand you're not doing anything right now. The last conversation we had was about a month ago. She said, but when things open up, I will be ready. Now, the other thing that really got my mind going was, creating or fine tuning presentations for buyers and sellers. So I think that every agent ought to have a short presentation, probably in PowerPoint, that they can either Zoom meeting with a client or a potential client or email to a client and then have a phone conversation. Now, when things get back to normal, and who knows when that will be and who knows what normal will look like, this same presentation would be on someone's device and they could walk through the presentation using this as support to remind themselves of what they wanna to say to their client. So I was talking to my agents about it. I've been doing Zoom meetings with them and I said, let me get you 
kind of a template of general stuff, but you're going to be able to tweak it as you wish. So I have two. I have ones for buyers and ones for sellers. One is for buyers, one is for sellers. Um, not a lot there in my presentations on how the process works because I wanted to keep them short and sweet. And I know REBI has a whole bunch of material about how the process works, how we work, the benefits of the agent and the company, what you do for them, why your company is where they want to be. And as a broker, I'm always looking for that brand to be consistent. I want my agents to be delivering not an identical message, but the same message. I don't want them all over the map. In other words, I have a vision of what my company stands for, what, for lack of a better word, our credo is, our mission statement, what is my company all about, and I really want my agents to be consistent with that. And this ties into broker branding. Some of you have a brand, you're in a franchise, so you have a very clear brand. Some of you are small independent, that's what I am, and we have our own brand with a mission statement and a philosophy and an authenticity. And so my company, talking points about my company, small, family owned, oldest company in my little town because my mother started it in the 1960s. Three generations in my family in this business. So that's telling you a lot about the company right there. So whatever your company is, you want to be able to brand it. So I know a lot of you have stuff, maybe your agents already have this and you don't need them. What I told Ginny and Maria before this started was I'm going to send the template PowerPoints onto them and you are free to use them as you wish. That's just my gift to you today. Um, so let me just kind of show you what I mean by these. I've got to get down here to my other one. Okay, so this is my company. And I just did a very quick slideshow. And I sent this to my agent. So obviously the agent would insure, insert the company information and the agent name there. And then this is the stuff about my company. And, and what should go in there is whatever is about somebody else's company. Now, you're then moving into why it's really important to not just have an agent, but have an awesome agent. It's a very important transaction. It does require expertise, should be in the hands of a professional. Experience. Now, my notes to my agents were on this slide, on the right-hand side, they can talk about their own experience. They can also, if they are relatively new to the business, talk about the fact we have a very strong mentoring program, but also talk about their life experience from other jobs, what they're bringing to the table into this job because we all bring life experiences to us. Then reputations, and this is a direct quote from a seller, but I tell them to go out and get a comment from a seller who's happy, get at least one. Then this slide, pretty self-explanatory, but you, you wanna get their wheels turning, the seller's wheels turning about what exactly is it you want from a realtor? Well, that's my home. And they are time and time again, that is one of the top things the seller wants. Market my home. Explain paperwork to me. So I send an email to someone who's thinking of selling on their own today. And in my document, because I actually attached a Word document, I said, let me talk to you for a minute about paperwork. When I started in real estate, we had a one-page form, eight and a half by 11, and the bottom part was blank. Standard form in Pennsylvania is now 14 pages. So the paperwork is much more complicated and you wanna make sure someone who's looking out for you is filling that out and or reviewing it before you sign it. Help me consider and respond to offers. Help me close the sale. So these are things that most agents are gonna tell you, yeah, absolutely, I do that all the time, all day long. But what do we do? So pricing, of course, I'm bilingual. I'm an appraiser and an agent. So I think pricing is probably one of the most important things. If you get it priced right, it's half sold already. That's the old saw, but it's true. So I always try to talk about how we will evaluate a home in terms of how it will appraise. 
here's the simple truth, and I say this in class all the time to agents. You know, if you list a house up here and you don't have comps that support that number, but nonetheless, you get somebody who's willing to pay up here, you still have to get through the appraisal hurdle. And if you couldn't find comps to support that value, the appraiser's not gonna find comps, and then it's going to get really ugly. Then, of course, my slide is talking about experience and expertise, but I tell my agents to fill in here whatever they want. And the day an agent gets a license anywhere in the country, they can price a house whether they know how to or not, which is a scary thing for me. Then marketing, response time, qualification of buyers, ability to work with other agents. I call this about um, playing well with others because we all know it's a uniquely cooperative business and we all know there are people in our business that other agents try to not work with because they're not cooperative and they're not pleasant and they're not honest and they're not ethical. So every listing presentation I give or my agents give, we try to emphasize we play well with others. We have a good reputation for cooperation. Um, talking about lost leads because agents don't respond, don't qualify, don't work well with other agents. What about financing? And again, this becomes a real important issue. You've got that property that would likely go FHA, but you know what, it's an estate. And you walk through it and you see at least 10 things that the FHA appraiser is going to pick up on and call for a, a repair on this property. So at this point, you need to have some advice with your seller. Now there's a couple ways they can go. The buyer can get a 203K FHA loan, which is a fix-up loan, and do the repairs on their own. Um, the seller can also go into it up front with a comment in the MLS. If FHA repairs are required, the buyer has to do them. And I've had a lot of sellers who are in that position, executors who are like, no, I'm not coming back to Pennsylvania from Kansas to paint that wall or whatever. Traditional agents, just happy to write the contract the way the buyer wants it, whether it's realistic or not. Earnest money. When I talk to the lawyers who run the legal hotline for my state association of realtors, this is something that surfaces a lot about how often agents do not get enough upfront earnest money. Now, number one, we all know earnest money is not required. It actually is not required. However, the seller has an absolute right to say, I want X amount of dollars. And the one attorney I've talked to has said, you know, I have people calling the legal hotline. They've got a sale falling apart at 500,000 and they've got a thousand dollar deposit, which is chump change to that buyer. They will walk away from that in a heartbeat. And you want that earnest money to deposit to mean something. So we talk about earnest money here. What about responding to an offer? Now on this slide, this is what we per do personally at my company. Dual agency is legal in my state. We don't practice single person disclosed dual agency. We have designated agency and that's what we do. Um, contracts, you're not, you know, it goes back into the agency thing, but on this slide, they can just make a point of, I understand contracts, I know how to fill them out, I'm looking out for you. Other offers, and this is a time that I have a conversation with sellers about, in some states there's language that says, if the seller has accepted an offer, the agent is not obligated to present subsequent offers. Doesn't say they have to, doesn't say they are not allowed to, just says kind of wishy-washy, they're not obligated to. I'm a believer, and I always say this when I teach SRS, that anything I know, my seller should know. And so I talk about how I will convey everything to them. Fees and costs, estimate of closing costs, when you list and with each offer you consider, and we talk about how our company policy is there for commission split. Why should I choose you? I will price your home properly. I will market it. I will respond. I will make it easy for other agents to show. I will put your interests above all others, including my own. And that, folks, is Code of Ethics, Article 1. What about problems? And again, you're talking about how your job is to solve them to your satisfaction. 
and how you are a problem solver. And uh, how does this work? Talk about the kind of contract we use. I always guarantee in writing people can fire me or my agents if they're not happy. And you know what? Nobody ever does. Because once you put it in writing that you're going to keep them happy, you do. And they don't fire you. And are you ready to make a decision? Do you have any questions? What terms shall we have? Let me explain the contract. So that's the seller one. Now, the buyer one, let me just get out of this one. I have to take my glasses off to see my screen better, which is kind of pathetic, but there you go. Uh, this one will go more quickly because it's basically just the other side of the coin we've been looking at. Your bullet points should be experience, local knowledge, other activities, picture goes on the right-hand side. So a lot of times our agents bring some local activity. They can also resonate with buyers. Here's how you know me. I, I'm on the board of directors for Little League as my daughter-in-law is, or I was the PTA president as my one agent Michelle was. So give some context to the buyer of how they know you. Talks about how important a home purchase is. And of course, one of the things that I always certainly harp on when I teach ABR, you know, buying a house is a very infrequent purchase. And it's a really important purchase and it, it deserves the utmost care from the agent because it's not like buying a dress and you get it home and you're like, eh, I don't like that thing. It's a really big deal if somebody buys the wrong house. So when you select an agent, you're gonna consider all of this. And what I tell my new agents is, if you don't have a lot of experience on your own, you're going to talk about the firm's experience and any mentoring programs that are available. Talk about life experience. I have a note here for my agent, Katie. She's had a number of jobs. She's a millennial in her 20s, great gal, and she's bringing some great life experience to it. Whatever education they have, especially designations, I'm an education junkie, as most everyone knows. Get, I told them to go and get a quote from a client, and they need to ask clients for them. Um, we really try to encourage our buyers and sellers to post on our Facebook business page the happy things they have to share about us. Then this is the parallel slide to the seller side. What do you want from an agent? This is the same thing though on the buyer side. And this is what everybody wants. Show me a house, explain financing, recommend inspectors, appraisers, et cetera, help me close the sale. But <clears throat> what do you provide? And a lot of this kind of goes back to the whole attitude in ABR. We're going to not leave any stone unturned to help you find a home. And we're going to do make our level best effort. We'll show you for sale by owners. We'll do whatever we can. Advising them on price. And this is a great point in this slide for the agent to make the point to the buyer. When you call the agent whose name is on the sign, they already have a client. That's the seller. And if they're doing their job as a seller's agent, and you say, well, what do you think of that price? Their response is gonna be, oh, it's a great price, you ought to pay it. What about financing? And again, if you're working for the buyer, not for the seller, you might say, hey, let's ask about some seller assist. Where can you get the best deal? And this goes back to, should I call the name on the sign? Um, so many times, people don't understand how our business works and people do call the name on the sign. And sometimes it's pretty disastrous. So, uh, you know, I always conclude a buyer presentation by saying, we're going steady and I'm the jealous type, so I better not see you out with any other realtors. Now, what about making an offer? And we're gonna develop a negotiating strategy, help write a contract, present the contract to the seller with the listing agent present, unless we have one of those circumstances where the seller has said in writing they don't want them there, or it's like a foreclosure. If you're doing a VA foreclosure, nobody talks to anybody, you upload it all to a website. Um, why should I choose you? And this goes back to why they get the best service out of buyer representation. And seller agent, they're going to solve the problem to the seller satisfaction. My job is to solve it to your satisfaction. And 
emphasizing again, business comes from repeat clients and you are a problem solver. Now this is kind of a um, clinch slide and not everyone has the guts to use this. I've shared this with other agents over the time. They kind of gulp sometimes. But I always tell agents, I understand buyers don't want to go steady on the first date, but you need to set a time frame after which they have to be in an exclusive contract with them. You cannot take free time and show people houses who are not committed to you. And of course, the second bullet point, I only work with four to six buyers at a time, and that was a strictly arbitrary number I put there. But it's not a bad idea to instill in someone's mind, my time is very valuable. I will only share it at one time with so many people. And when it comes to buyers, you have to be financially qualified and motivated and willing to commit, in which case you're going to get absolutely awesome service. And I'm going to make this a beautiful transaction for you. And this is very gutsy. Then are you ready to make a decision? Do you have any questions? What terms shall we have? Let me explain the contract. So all of that just kind of walks you through the ideas of them, of what you might want to say. Okay, let me get back to here. So those were just some thoughts for you today. If you don't have these at all, great idea to get them now. If you have them but they're rusty, great idea to polish them up a little bit. I would really think about setting a time with your agents, whether you do it by Zoom or however, where people have personalized their own presentations and maybe do a rehearsal. People sometimes look aghast when you say rehearsal. I'm a speaker. I rehearse all the time. I don't know how many mirrors and how many hotel rooms have heard all about financing and pricing and all kinds of other stuff. But the truth of the matter is, it's not that someone has to recite it verbatim. But when they rehearse it, it's going to sound better and they're going to be more at ease with it. So this leads us into something else we want our agents to have, that elevator speech, and we need to have one. It's gotta be quick, authentic, and it's a verbal introduction to who you are, what you do, and what is your differentiation. I really was spending a lot of time to getting ready for this thinking about differentiation. So everyone on this call is probably what I would call a realtor junkie. Please don't take offense at that. I mean it in the nicest possible way. What do I mean by realtor junkie? We go to meetings. We go to national meetings, state meetings, local meetings. We go to designation classes. We serve on committees. We are really in to being realtors. Our blood is realtor blue. Um, so we're really into it. The sad thing is the general public doesn't necessarily know the difference between an agent who's got the CRB designation or the ABR designation or the SRS designation or the RENE designation than they do from Joe Schmo, who just got his license three months ago and is getting absolutely no training and hasn't a clue what he's doing. So it's our job to make people aware of what makes us special, what makes us different, what makes us preferable. So this is something else we can be working on because we've got all this time, and there's days that I'm just a little bit bored with weeding, so I'm looking at a lot of this stuff. So getting to the end of this, here's what we can do with this time. It can be a penalty or it can be a gift. It's all in how you look at it. If people have decided it's going to be a penalty and they're going to be angry about it, then they're going to sit and sulk until it's over. And sitting and sulking is not going to make it go away or make it go any quicker. It's just gonna make them miserable while they're doing it. Or you can see it as a gift. So I'm seeing it as a gift in terms of reading. I finally finished David McCullough's biography of Truman. Darn near a thousand pages, extremely well-written book, really enjoyed it. Done a lot of closet cleaning out. Because I've been in contact with my son's family since this began, I've gotten some great times with my grandchildren doing things like puzzles with them. So it's a gift. And I know the adults will look back on this one way, but I wonder how many kids will look back on this as that was a really neat time because we did all those cool things. We had 
uh, a fire pit in the backyard or we watched movies or we did puzzles or whatever. So make it a gift. Take this time to beef up everything you wanted to beef up in your business. All that stuff that you said for years, you know, if I just had time, I would do X, Y, and Z and take it and do it. And absolutely, I totally believe this, this will end. I don't know when, but it will end. Okay, I somehow did that, pause share. Okay, and I don't, Ginny, how am I doing here? You are doing good. Okay, what questions do we have? Yes, we do have a few here. Okay. Um, one, let me quick get to everybody because there's a couple in here. So um, everyone, uh, Melanie is going to send us those templates and we will post them as a download uh, with the recording. So they'll be up there tomorrow. And then somebody asked about um, listing presentation. So in addition to what Melanie's going to share, um, let me turn on my camera here. Uh, REBI also um, has a buyer, uh, separate two separate uh, templates that are customizable, a buyer uh, counseling presentation and a seller counseling tape, uh, uh, presentation. And between Melanie's and that one, they'll complement each other because ours really helps you take both a buyer and a seller through a transaction and what you can and can't do by office policy, what you can and can't do by license law. Um, what they can expect throughout the process, like how you'll deal with open houses, how you'll deal with multiple offers, how you'll deal with um, home inspections, things like that. And we're going to give you a special code for a buy one, get one free that we'll post on the website. Um, there are samples that you can take a look at. So if you go to rebiinstitute.com forward slash shop, uh, if you uh, don't want to wait till tomorrow, you can use summer or I'm sorry, spring 20, spring 20, and you'll be able to buy one, get one. And then, of course, you can download um, Melanie's. So um, let me just quick look here at the questions. Um, Melanie, back, I think, when you had one of your sample presentations up, we have a question that says uh, for an FHA loan that a buyer would be responsible for repairs, how would that work? Oh, okay, great question. So, um, because it becomes a real sticking point, if they do a 203k loan, they can do it, but what happens with the 203k? There's an appraisal done as is, there's an appraisal done as complete. As long as there's enough distance between those that the person get, can get the repairs done, the repair money is doled out as the repairs are done. They usually have a building, a home inspector, um, come up with a list of what has to be done and then they certify that things are done. Other than that, if it's minor stuff and what sometimes, I'm sorry, I have an itchy nose, what sometimes happens in my area, it's allergies folks, it's not COVID. Uh, what sometimes happens in my area is it is minor. It's peeling, flaking, scaling paint, one of the FHA familiar things. It's a missing handrail. And it's stuff that a lot of times a buyer with maybe some assistance from another family member can do on their own and it doesn't cost a ton of money. But again, if you've got that executor who's in another state, they're saying to you, I don't really wanna come in and paint the porch because it needs to be painted to make the FHA appraiser happy. Perfect. Um, okay, let's see here. Uh, if anybody else has any questions, I'm going to do a last call here. If you want to type those into the chat, um, we will make sure we get to your question. So, Melanie, a lot of compliments. Great presentation. Very uplifting. Great information. Love some of the suggestions in your buyer presentation for sure. Uh, lang you know, sometimes when you're sitting there trying to come up with the language and the right bullets to write, and you suddenly you get those from someone else and it all makes sense. So um, I'm always so proud to be part of this organization, Jenny. I really am. Great. Thank you. One more. I think it's a clarification on what you just said. Um, somebody says, I'm confused. Buyers can't do repairs, FHA loan, question mark. They do them all the time in my area. Um, we, in Pennsylvania, we have a form because we've got forms for everything that allows the buyer and seller signs, and let's just say I'm the FHA buyer, I'm buying your house and the Porsche needs to be painted. Um, 
we have a document that gives me permission to go onto the property, paint the porch in a workmanlike manner at my own cost with the understanding that if the sale falls through, you get a painted porch, that's the way it goes. Right. But yeah, FHA has not, in my experience, ever had a problem with who does the repairs. They just want them done. Yeah. Somebody else commented, they do them too. It's a risk, but it has worked out. Yeah, so. exactly. Okay. Well, Melanie, I don't see any further questions. Just a reminder, everyone, if you can hang on till tomorrow, you'll have access to the recording and you can share that link with others. Totally fine. You'll get the downloadable templates and uh, we'll have those up uh, later tomorrow afternoon, if not sooner. We just have to wait for Zoom to process the recording and give us access. Um, well, always else? fun to work with you guys. Yes, thank you uh, so much. Somebody else asked about the slides again. So you'll get the recording, not Melanie's slides. Those are proprietary speaker slides, but we will give you access to those two presentations that she's going to share. Um, Melanie, somebody's asking um, for your information. I don't know if there's an email you wanna. Oh, there we go. I'm gonna type it in right now. Okay, she's gonna type in her email address, everyone. I also have a Facebook page. Melanie J. McLean, real estate educator. And Jenny, there's no pictures of Maggie the Wonder Dog on that <laughs> real estate all the time. But um, so, for example, I'm going to share later today, article in today's Wall Street Journal saying, surprisingly, it doesn't look like prices are taking the hit yep. on homes that they thought they were going to, which I thought was great news. Great. So there you go. There's it's Melanie at the Melanie group.com and then look for her Facebook page, Melanie J. McLean, real estate educator. Awesome. Um, and um, let's see, can you send me all the resources and webinar info through email? Um, Chicha, I can't send that to you through email because we have a couple hundred people on these webinars. So there's not a way for us to manage sending things to several hundred folks. So they'll be on the web page and you can get everything there. Um, okay, jo Joyce, if you're looking for her contact, it's Melanie. So her email's in the chat, Melanie, M-E-L-A-N-I-E at themelaniegroup.com. Okay, and any upcoming webinars are right on our webpage as well. But as I mentioned before, the majority of our webinars, other than these six that we're doing, are uh, members only for CRB and SRS designees. But that button will show you all the webinars you can sign up for. We have one on Friday available to everyone on multiple offers, and you can register for that on our webpage. That, click that big orange button I told you, and you'll see a place to register for that one tomorrow. If I can well, just jump in, because yeah. I'm privileged to be on some of the REBI committees, REBI has really stepped up to the plate for members, not just of the Institute, but all NAR members during this crisis, and it is very appreciated. Great. Thank you, Melanie. Um, so thank you so much for sharing your time with us today, Melanie, and some valuable information for everyone. We really appreciate it. And from REBI to all of you on the webinar, we wish you the best and we hope that you, your family and colleagues remain safe and healthy during these challenging times. And we look forward to seeing you again. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye.